right, John chapter 10, 10th chapter of John's gospel. We left off the last time we were together at verse 21. And as we pick it up in verse 22, we're really entering into a theological minefield is what we're doing, okay? A part of our text tonight has perhaps split more churches and brought more division within the body of Christ than maybe any other portion in the New Testament. And the other part of our text tonight has been ripped out of, con- out of context, if you will, by some of the, the cult groups out there in order to come up with some very, very uh, wacky theology. So we've got a kind of a theological minefield in front of us here, some very challenging, challenging doctrine. So I will do my very best to have a little something to offend everyone with. But I think that if we will pay attention, close attention, to who it is that Jesus is talking about and what exactly it is that he's saying, I think that that will clear up a lot of the confusion and a lot of the misunderstanding. Now, I think we could probably subtitle the last half of chapter 10, The Showdown on Solomon's Porch. Jesus is now going to have another blowout with these religious leaders, all right? Now the time frame, the time frame that this happens is, is what is described for us in verse 22. So digging in very quickly tonight, we discover we're going to be jumping ahead in time here from where we left off last week. Uh, Gina, let's read verse 22. At that time, the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem. All right, let's underline dedication. This is letting us know. That between verse 21, where we left off last time, and where we pick it up now in verse 22, that there is roughly a three-month gap of time between these two verses. Now, the last time we were with Jesus in chapters 8 and 9, in the last part of chapter, or first part of chapter 10, rather, is he was at Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles. And we know that the Feast of Tabernacles took place in the latter part of of September. Here, we're told that it's the Feast of Dedication. This was also known as the Feast of Lights. This is what you and I know as Hanukkah. Okay? Now, Hanukkah, as you know, takes place near the last part of December. I think last year, Hanukkah uh, began on on the 20th of, of December. So, in between verse 21, where we left off, and here in verse 22, we now find ourselves having moved from the latter half of September to now the last part of the month of December. And John John adds uh, some seasonal narrative in here. He he lets us know that it's it's winter. Uh, Some of you have that in the first part of uh, verse 23 in your translations. Now, you remember in the law that God gave Israel seven feasts that would bring them to Jerusalem three times a year. In the spring... They would have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Passover, and First Fruits. All three feasts fell during one week's time in the spring. Every Jew showed up for that, okay? You would go home then, you'd wait 50 days, and then you would turn around and you would come back to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. Then you would go back home and remain there for a fairly lengthy period of time. Then you would show up in the fall to celebrate the Feast of Trumpets, Tabernacles, and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Now, there were two other feasts, two other holidays that they added after the law was given to them. One took place in the springtime of the year, and it was known as the Feast of Purim. And what that did was commemorate the events that we read about in the book of Esther. Uh, With seismic brevity, you remember that the uh, Israelites were in Persian captivity. And a a very wicked general under that that Persian king by the name of Haman, I probably would have called him Haman, nice shot. But um, he, he, he just hated the Jews. He had a thing against the Jews and he wanted to see them wiped out. He convinced the king to add some law to the, the, uh, uh, the books there that would eliminate the Jews, and then God rose, rose up a Jew by the name of, a Jewess by the name of Esther. She became the queen, and through her, famous verse, 
Uncle Mordecai, cousin Mordecai, actually tells her, you know, you were raised for such a time as this. You know, we quote that verse quite often. And, and she gets with the king, and, and the king amends the law, and, and it, it winds up being Haman, my shot, that gets hung instead of the Israel. So uh, they celebrated the Feast of Purim to recognize that uh, deliverance. There was a filter reference in there for some of you uh, rock fans out there. Now, the second feast that was instituted outside of the law, if you will, was the Feast of Dedication or the Feast of Lights. Again, what you and I would know today as Hanukkah. About 160 years before Christ was born, you remember that Alexander the Great had died. And fulfilling, really, the prophecy that Daniel gives us in, in the 8th chapter of his book, his kingdom, Alexander the Great's kingdom, was divided into four parts. After that happened, a number of generals rose to prominence. One of the generals that came to power under one of those four surviving kingdoms was a very wicked and a very hot-tempered Seleucid general by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. Okay? One day... This guy, Antiochus Epiphanes, tried to, to unsuccessfully take over Egypt for the second time. You know that phrase, line in the sand, that we have? That came from Antiochus Epiphanes' confrontation with the Roman general. Rome was beginning to come into power at that time. Antiochus Epiphanes is marching down there. Rome gets wind of this. They send their generals down there, and they draw a line in the sand around this guy and say, Look, you're not going in there. This is not going to happen under our watch. Now, you better make a decision. Tell me what to go back and tell the Roman general. And he wound up retreating. Again, very hot-headed guy. In a fit of rage, he's coming back through Jerusalem on the way home, and he kills, he massacres 80,000 Jews. Okay? He then sets up an image, an image of Zeus within their temple. He begins to slaughter pigs on the altar of, of God. They're in the tabernacle, in the temple area there. And um, he outlawed circumcision. He outlawed a number of their rights at the, at the time. And, you know, as you could imagine, again, the Jews were enraged. They were absolutely enraged over what was happening there. So they began to bring in insurgents, if you will. And they had uh, one of these guys was kind of a huge guy, WWF kind of guy, and he was known as Judas the Hammer. Great warrior, really pretty bad dude, all right? And under his leadership, the nation eventually drove Antiochus out of the temple and out of Israel. Well, now they had a problem. Because as you know, the Jews were very legalistic. You know, how do we cleanse the temple? This thing is defiled, it's been trashed, and they had discovered that all of their ritual oil had been um, polluted, if you will. It couldn't be used. Some of you Bible students remember in the Old Testament, God said, hey, here's the instructions for the oil. Very specific. It's got to go this way, that way, and the other way. And so they had one day's supply of oil was all they had left. The rest had been defiled. Now, it would take them at least a week to go through this process to produce what they would consider a ceremonially clean, a ceremonial, <laughs> ceremonially cleansed oil. Say that ten times fast. But... It would take a week to produce that, but, but what they did was they took the one day supply worth of oil that they had and they lit it by faith. And that thing stayed lit for eight straight days on one day's worth of oil. And so the Jew said, hey, this is a miracle. God has kept the menorah lit. That's why on a Hanukkah menorah they have eight candles as opposed to your garden variety uh, normal menorah that has seven. And so this now was the celebration where Jesus was on this particular feast. This was the Feast of Hanukkah. So we're three months from where we were at in verse 21. But it also means now that we're three months from the crucifixion, Christ will be tortured to death in about 90 days. All right? Imagine... Now get inside the text with me, guys. We're setting the scene here. Imagine what kind of frame of mind you would be in if you were walking in his sandals. And he knew it. This wasn't something that was a surprise to him, right? He knew within three months' time he would be going through some unbearable physical, emotional, and spiritual torture. So that now is the time, and we have the place described for us here in verse 23, 
Gina, let's look at verse 23. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. All right, so the place is Solomon's porch. The time, last part of December, place, Solomon's porch. Again, you might have Solomon's colonnade in your translation. You might have the portico of Solomon, as I do here. Now, don't misunderstand, this is not a porch as you and I might think of a porch, all right? Solomon's porch was huge. It was the part of the temple that was built for public assembly. It had this awning that was supported through a a series of, of columns and pillars for the purpose of getting people in out of the weather. Now, their winter, not like our winters, right? Middle East. It snowed very infrequently. Most of the time it was just a rainy season. So they needed to get people out of the rain, and in the summer they had a need to get them in from out of the hot sun. We know in the book of Acts that Peter made a presentation of the gospel there at Solomon's porch, and 5,000 people received the Lord, right? So you're talking about an area that would have thousands and thousands and thousands of people on it. So it's huge. The scene is this, it's three months later, it's winter, and Christ is walking through this large open area called Solomon's uh, portico. Now, to the confrontation then, let's pick it up in verse 24, and Gina, let's look at 24. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. All right, now don't misunderstand. It's not that he's walking through this large open court area and he just happens to run into a few Pharisees. Underline that word surrounded, okay? You might have gathered around in your translation. In the Greek, this is a very strong term. It's a very aggressive term. It means they box the guy in. It means literally that they surrounded him on all sides. This phrase in the Greek has the idea of trapping someone. All right, very aggressive move on the part of the Pharisees. He's walking in this large open area, and they've got their thugs strategically placed. Hey, Christ is coming through. When you see the signal, man, we're going to come at him from all directions, okay? So they've got him totally surrounded. Remember, they've tried to arrest him twice now, a couple of different occasions, and he keeps getting away. So they've decided, hey, We're going to surround this guy, and we are going to take care of business. And so they surround him, and they essentially say, hey, we are not going to let you go until you go on record as to just who it is you are purporting yourself to be, good man. So just shoot straight with us, all right? Who are you making yourself out to be? Of course, that's not their real motive. We'll get to that in a bit. But notice in verse 25, Christ is not rattled a bit. Gina, let's look at 25. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. All right. (laughs) Jesus, now I have told you already and you still don't believe. What more do you people want, right? I mean, that's what he's telling them. He is going to answer them. Very directly down in verse 30 here in a bit, but he's got a point or two to make here. Now, as far as going public with who he was, he had done that, you remember, with great force back in chapter 8, right? They get into a little discussion, Abraham's name comes up, and Christ says, look, before Abraham was born, I am. He used the name that Jehovah used with Moses back in Exodus 3, Hey, Lord, who should I tell them sent me? They're not going to tell them the great I am sent you, okay? They got that. They understood that. Again, we'll see that a little bit later. Now, you remember he had also, he, he has said who he was privately as well, not just publicly. You remember the woman at the well in John chapter 4. She said, I know the Messiah is coming. And he said, I that speak to you am he. John 4, 24 and 25. We just read that again back in chapter 9 with the blind guy, right? Who is the Lord? Again, Christ said, it's me, man. It is he who is now speaking to you. So at this point in his ministry, he has stated very clearly who he was, both publicly and privately. 
And so he says, look, I already told you. Now he also mentions that they should know who he is by what he has done, by his works. We're going to get to that further in verse 37. Listen, here's the deal, all right? Here's the deal. These guys don't really want to hear what they already know Jesus thinks of himself, all right? They already get that he thinks he is the Christ, and they're going to confess that much in a bit. What these guys are doing is simply trying to catch the guy after two failed attempts, all right? The problem here is not that they need to hear it again. They just want another opportunity to catch the guy. That's what's going on here. The real problem is unbelief. Notice verse 26. Gina, let's look at 26 and 27. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. All right. Now, you recognize this language, right? He's referring them back to what he said in the first part of chapter 10. Three months earlier in our story here, last week for you and I, but three months earlier in our story here, where he said, I have sheep, and my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. Okay? Now, he is saying to these leaders, and man, really mark the order of this, all right? He is saying to these leaders, you do not believe. Why? You do not believe because you are not my sheep. Did you hear that? Did you hear the order of that? You do not believe because you are not my sheep. Now, think about what Christ is saying here. I mean, this gets rather deep, does it not? Jesus is not saying you're not mine because you don't believe. He is saying you don't believe because you're not mine. In other words, non-ownership was what was creating the unbelief. It wasn't that somehow the unbelief was creating the non-ownership. Okay? In other words, believing proves the belonging. If you belong to Jesus, then you believe. If you do not belong to Jesus, then you don't believe. So that means tonight, if you are not following Jesus, if you have had ample opportunity to receive Christ and you refuse to do it, then there is a reasonably good chance that the reason why you've rejected Christ is because you just don't belong to him. Ooh. Now somebody says, well, wait a minute. I don't like the sound of that. Well, you can fix it real easy. All you have to do is invite Christ into your life to be your Lord and Savior, and you'll discover that you are chosen of God and that you do belong to him. Well, I don't want to go there. I just don't want... Well, then whose fault is that? Right? You're like the guy hitting himself in the face. It hurts every time I hit myself in the face. Well, stop it. I don't want to stop it. Well, then quit complaining. I mean, if you don't want to come to Christ, don't complain then that there is the possibility you don't belong to him. Do you see the madness in that? Now, you remember the last time we were together that he gave the illustration of a community corral. Well, here you have all kinds of herds and flocks right in this corral. And you would have a shepherd that would go into that corral. Sometimes he would sing. Sometimes he would call them out by name. And sheep from all over this community pen, from various shepherds, right, their ears would perk up. Hey, I know that voice. That's the sound of my shepherd, okay? Now, the gospel goes forth to the entire world, all right? And it is God's will that all men be saved, 2 Peter 3, 9. The invitation is, whosoever will, let him come to the Lord, Right? And so the sound of the gospel goes out across humanity and within humanity, there's a person here and there's a person over there and there's a group over here. They begin to hear the sound of the voice of Christ and they recognize that sound and they respond and they come. Now Jesus is saying here that look, if you don't believe, it's because you're not my sheep. So what he is about to say in verse 28, we've got a theological minefield coming up here. What he's about to say in verse 28 applies to those of us today who can say, the Lord is my shepherd. 
If you can say that, the reason why you can say that is because the Father and the eternal counsels of God chose you and then gave you to Jesus Christ, okay? And you should feel great about that. Somewhere in the eternal past, God knew you and he picked you and he chose you to be given to his only begotten son. You should feel great about that. That's why in John 17, Jesus prays to the Father saying, you know what? I I pray not for the world, Father, but I pray for those whom you have given to me, John 17, 9. God picked you, God the Father chose you, then he gave you to his Son. Paul said to the Ephesians that we were chosen in Christ before the foundations of the world, Ephesians 1, 4. Peter said, we are the the elect of God according to the foreknowledge of God. So what he promises us now in verse 28 is only to those who can say, yes, the Lord is my shepherd. The promise in verse 28 is given to those of us who have been chosen by the Father somewhere in the eternal past, given to the Son, and we have now been drawn to the Son because we have somehow recognized that voice. We've recognized the voice of our shepherd, and now we follow him. What is that promise? Notice now verse 28. Let's look at 28 and 29. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. All right, let's underline my hand at the end of verse 28, and then Father's hand at the end of verse 29. This is amazing. Now, he is talking about those who can say, the Lord is my shepherd. If you can say that this evening, then you are eternally secure in Jesus Christ. Eternal security is for those who can say the Lord is my shepherd, who are truly the lambs that belong to the Lord. Now, Jesus did say, did he not, that not all who say unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 7, 21. We've already read back in chapter 6, right, that ominous verse, John 6, 6, 6, that from that time forward, many of his disciples turned their backs on him and no longer followed him. You see, there were a group of people, they appeared to be genuine, they appeared to be disciples of God, and they were following Christ. But then, Jesus started to say, listen, some very hard things. And they're thinking, this is not what I signed up for, man. I mean, I'm sorry, but this dying to the, you know, this dying to myself and taking up my cross business, man, you can go fly a kite with that deal, all right? I'm out of here. In the beginning, there were signs that they were genuine and they were interested and they were following. Now, I think that you will see by and large, that there are always going to be a group of people who are a little bit interested in spiritual things. They get curious about spiritual things. I think that sometimes they hit a rough spot in life. Maybe, you know, the marriage is on the rocks or their job or they don't quite know what to do. And then somebody tells them, well, you know, our pastor is doing a series on marriage. Why don't you come? And so they come. Or well, he's doing a series on debt management and, you know, finding your direction financially. And so, you know, maybe this would benefit you. And what's going on is this. And this is where the church in this country, I think, has had some real difficulty over the course of the past 20 years. This is the problem. We are marketing the church in such a way that we are trying to get people to come to church for other reasons than their sinful condition before a holy God. Okay, I'm coming to church because I want to learn how to be a better dad. I'm coming to church because I want to get out of debt or or I want to be a better husband or whatever. What we have done to the church is we have turned it into the Oprah Winfrey show, right? 
I mean, we've got the psychologists. We bring them in, and they give us the, the latest psychology. And we'll, then we'll bring in the financial advisors, and, and then we'll bring in the healers. And, you know, and Christ said, look, man, my, my disciples continue in my word. All right? He said that he that keeps my commandments, it is he that loves me. A number of years ago, well-known uh, men's ministry, promise keepers. You heard of them? Okay. A number of years ago, they, the promise keepers themselves, they commissioned the Barna group to come in and do a study because promise keep, keepers recognized that their promise keepers were not keeping their promises. I mean, they recognized that these men that were involved in the or- organization struggled with pornography as much as anybody it showed that they studied, struggled with drugs just as much as anybody. And they struggled with divorce just as much as... There was virtually no difference in behavior. And so, why is this happening? Well, because for 25, 20, 25 years we've been recruiting people into the church for reasons other than their sinful condition before a holy God. Listen, we're showing them what to do instead of who they are. Okay, we don't show them who they are before a holy God. We give them things to do. We've become the Oprah show and let's bring in Dr. Phil. And we've bought this bill of goods about, you need an accountability partner. You know, boy, if I get an, if I get an accountability partner, boy, you know, I'm going to be flying the straight and narrow because that's all I need in my life. Look, you need spiritual people in your life, no doubt. But you can lie to your accountability partner. If you think that an accountability partner is going to help you live for God, you're hallucinating. All right? You can have accountabilities coming out your ears and you can just keep lying to them. But you can't lie to God. I think we are bringing people into the church for the wrong reasons right out of the gate. And if they understood who they were, instead of giving them stuff to do, if they understood their sinful condition before God, man, that's where it starts The rest will take care of itself, right? Seek first the kingdom and everything else will come upon you. Matthew 6, 33. That's where it needs to start if we desire transformation in the church. We can't have a social club. We might set people up for an emotional high that might last three months, six months, maybe even a year. All right? We can't give people things to do. We have to show them who they are. Are and man, if we do that, God will take it from there. We have to direct the lost to developing a relationship with Jesus Christ and no other motive. The rest is just a bogus smoke and mirrors, temporary fix. Okay, now I am a believer in eternal security, but I do not believe that everybody that attends a church service has eternal security. You only have eternal security if you belong to the shepherd. If you belong to Jesus Christ and you are following him. If you can turn and walk away, the Bible says you were never a disciple to begin with. 1 John 2.19 Now, having said all that, this is amazing news for those of us that belong to him. The promise that, is, that, that he gives us here is that no one will ever snatch you out of my hand. If you got a King Jimmy, you might have the word man there. That's in italics. That lets us know it wasn't in the original manuscript. What he's saying in here is no force on heaven or earth is ever going to take you away from me. You remember Paul said to the Romans, what can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. There is no demon around the corner. There is no devil that you need to be afraid of. You are eternally secure in the hands of Christ. But again, eternal security doesn't go to all. Eternal security is only offered to those who truly belong to the Lord. So this is the emphasis of this security, that here we are in the eternal counsels of God. He picked you. He chose, me, he chose you. 
He knows your name. He knows how many hairs are on your head for crying out loud. Matthew 10, 30, okay? He picked you. He chose you. He knows you to the finest detail, to every cell within every fiber of your being, and then he gave you to his son. And his son is holding you in the palm of his hand. And his son is saying, you're precious. You're precious, and I am not going to let you go. You are mine. You belong to me. You've been given to me by the Father, and there isn't any power in heaven or earth that can pluck you out of my grasp. And if that weren't good enough, on top of that, notice the Father puts his hands on us as well. Verse 28, no one will take them out of my hand. Verse 29, no one will take them out of the Father's hand. For crying out loud, as my dad used to say, if I am in the hand of my son and I am in the hand of my father, what in the world can ever touch my life that somehow is not part of God's will? God loves you, dear friends. And he knows everything about you. And you are eternally secure in his hands. Continue in his word. Continue to follow his voice. And you will be kept from all evil, Jude 1.1. You and I are not secure because we're wonderful people. All right? You and I are secure because we have a wonderful Savior. All right. Well, let's pick it up in verse 30. Jesus now gives them... Finally, his answer, in a pretty short verse, Gina, take a deep breath, verse 30. I and the Father are one. I need more of a break than that. Say that again. I and the Father are one. Yes. Now, throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus has been claiming that he is equal to the Father. You remember he said back in chapter 5 that he was Equal in capability that he said that whatever the Father does, that's what I do, John 5, 19. There is nothing that the Father can do that the Son cannot do. If I said I can do everything you can do and I could do it the very same way you're doing it, am I not claiming that I'm equal to you in that thing? Jesus said, I do what the Father does. But then he takes it a step further and he claims not only is he equal in capability, but he is equal in nature, in very essence. He is saying, I am the Son, child. I am the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God. Your children, your sons, your daughters, they share your nature, okay? Your fallen human nature is what your children share with you. That's why they're the way they are. They're like you, right? They share our fallen nature. Christ, however, was the only begotten of the Father. John 1.14, right? Now, we say that we are children of God, but we are what? The adopted children, okay? Ephesians 1.5, look at half of the book of Romans. I share God's nature, you share God's nature, inasmuch as the Holy Spirit now indwells me as a believer in Christ. But I am not the only begotten. I do not share the same substance with the Father. Now, the Trinity, that's a difficult thing for us. I and the Father are one. How can the one God have within it three different personages. The reason why the Trinity is difficult to comprehend is because you have the finite, you and me, trying to comprehend the infinite. How is that possible? It is not. All right? Not on this side of the resurrection. Although 1 Corinthians 13, 12, one day you will fully know, okay? You don't have to go very far in the Bible before you figure out this is a strange God. This is a strange God we worship. In the opening chapter of Genesis, he says, let us make man in our image. Genesis 1.26. Us? 
hour? What's that all about? And of course, the people that deny the deity of Christ say, well, <laughs> he's talking about angels there. You know? well, where is it written that we are created in the image of angels? You know, over and over and over again, we have discovered we are created in the image of God and the word of God. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, do not forget your creator in your youth, lest you grow old into age and forget them. Them? Them is my creator? Maybe in Kentucky. And so the early church fathers, they recognized that, look, the father is called God, the son is called God, the spirit is called God, and yet the Bible declares there is only one God. Now, Paul invites us in Ephesians to embrace that mystery. Man, don't make, you are an ant trying to, you are the gap between an ant walking on that floor and, and getting this conversation. Take that gap, okay? Measure that gap in your mind, if you will, of understanding. What's the difference between that ant's understanding of this conversation? Now, multiply that gap exponentially into infinity, and you still won't come up with even a sliver of the gap between us and a holy God. Don't make, don't, you know, J.B. Phillips said, a God that is small enough to understand is, is not big enough to worship. Don't make, don't ever make mystery your enemy. Make it be that which causes you to worship. All right? I and the Father are one. And so when Christ says that, he is not saying, well, you know, me and the Father have the same agenda. He is not saying we're like-minded. That's not what he's saying. Jesus is saying to these guys, look, you know the Father is God. He and I are one. Connect the dots, dudes. I am God. I am your God manifested in the flesh. You are speaking to your God. Okay? Now, listen. <laughs> to the Jews' credit, they understood. They understood exactly what he was saying. Notice verse 31. Let's read 31 to 33. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Okay, could you read the last part of verse 33 again? Because you... Because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Oh, they got it. They get it. This whole thing's a ruse. We'll get to it. We've kind of already got to it. Now that phrase, make yourself there, make yourself out to be God, you might have claim to be in your translation. That phrase, make yourself out or claim to be, is in what we call the present perfect tense in the Greek which means this is what you are habitually doing. These guys definitely get it. They are saying to Jesus, you are constantly, habitually going around, saying and acting as if you are God. And we've had a belly full of it, to be honest with you. And we're here to take care of business. We want you off the scene because it is your habit. It's what you keep doing. You won't stop doing it. You're always making yourself out to be God. Now, those who say that Jesus never claimed to be God have evidently never read John chapter 10, okay? Now, tune in with me here. Get this, guys. If this is not what Jesus wanted to communicate, you're constantly making yourself out to be God. He would have said, whoa, whoa, whoa here, boys. Whoa, hold up here. No, you know, no, boy, do we ever have a misunderstanding here, guys. Hold the phone, all right? I mean, I am in no way suggesting that I am actually God here. He does not correct their interpretation. He does not correct their interpretation of what he just said in verse 30. This puts to bed, sweet dreams now, any absurd notion that Jesus never claimed to be God. The person that says that is revealing their ignorance to you. Love them, have compassion, show them, okay? Now, there's something here I want you to mark very carefully, okay? I want you to notice a couple things about the works of Jesus in verse 32. Underline the word good. 
good works. Take a minute to do that. And then I want you to underline from the Father right after it. Two things I want you to notice here, okay? Number one, they're good. Number one, they're good. That's a rule of thumb. We always repeat what I say if somebody walks by because you all go. It's, it's interesting looking up here when a kid walks by. Two things we want to notice about the works of Christ. Number one, they're good, all right? Everything that Christ seeks to do is good. Listen, everything that Christ wants to do in your life is good. He gave sight to the blind. That's good. He gave hearing to the deaf. Great. The ability to walk to a lame man. Wonderful. Everything that Christ did was good. We read in the book of Acts that he went about everywhere doing good. Good. When Christ looks at your life, what does he want to do? Good. Good. We have this irrational fear of the will of God so often, right? Well, I don't want to do the will of God because I'm going to end up in Africa or some God-forsaken place, pun intended. I don't want to do the will of God. I'm going to be slinging soup in Swahili. Listen, when Christ looks at your life, he wants to do good. God knows what's best for you. Not just here, but again, for all of eternity, He is doing an eternal work in us, not a temporary one. And so what so often keeps the Lord from doing what is best in our life is our own stinking, stubborn will. I don't want to go that way. I don't want to receive that. I don't want to take that counsel. I want to go this way, all right? Let me encourage you, submit to the Lord, all right? Submit to whatever convictions the Spirit is placing upon your heart because the outcome is going to be good. good. The works of Christ are good. good. Number two. Notice that these works are from the Father. Again, we've got this concept. Well, we've got the bad Old Testament God that's a bit edgy, right? He's kind of a cranky God. And then we've got the kinder, gentler version of God in the New Testament. So we've got good God, bad God going on, right? Nothing could be further from the truth. Both the Father and the Son desire to do good in your life. All right, glad we got that settled. Phew. So the Jews, Jesus, you're constantly saying that you're God, and this is blasphemy, man. Underline blasphemy. They're accusing Christ of blasphemy. Now, picking it up in verse 34, we've got another theological minefield here because of the way Christ chooses to answer this charge of blasphemy. Notice verse 34. Gina, let's do 34 to 36. Jesus answered them, Has it not been written in your law, I said, you are gods? If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said, I am the Son of God? All right. Now, the Mormons are very quick to jump on this and say, Aha! You see, this is Bible proof that one day we're all going to be gods. Mormon doctrine teaches that Adam was faithful to the very end, and so he was exalted to godhood. Now, when you and I pray to our Father in heaven, according to Mormon doctrine, we are praying to none other than Adam. Okay? And Adam came into the garden with one of his celestial, a bunch of celestial wives. Adam came into the garden with one of his celestial wife, wives, Eve, And he began to have spirit babies. And you and I are the byproduct of that union. And if we will be faithful, according to the Mormon doctrine, we will progress to the place where we will all be gods in substance. They are very fond of saying, as man now is, God once was, and as God now is, man may become. So you just be faithful and you can enter into godhood. And they say, see... 
right here, Jesus says, that some of these ancient Israelite dudes attained godhood. Oh boy. The trouble, the the tangled webs we weave. The trouble we can get into when we fail to look at the full counsel of God. If you don't understand Christ, if you don't understand the truth, it's because you don't understand the full counsel of God. Humble yourself in order that God will reveal his truth to you, okay? A couple of things here. Number one, Jesus is quoting Psalm 82, verse 6. And the context of this psalm was that there were a group of judges that acted unjustly, okay? They didn't do their job. They blew the call, all right? You remember in the book of Judges, you remember in the Old Testament that God appointed a number of judges to act as arbitrators over the law, not unlike the role that our judges play today. Number two, why were these judges, though, referred to, called gods? Good question. Seems a little weird, right? Now, the word for God in Psalm 82.6 is Elohim. Plural. Refers to the Trinity, gods. We have to remember, friends, that the original language of the Bible, both Hebrew and Greek, are considerably more layered and more complex than than our English, okay? Now, in the Hebrew, Elohim was used for God, but it also had a number of other uses. The word literally means, Elohim means mighty ones. It was used specifically for judges and magistrates. In fact, if you go to any good Bible dictionary, you'll you'll discover that judges and magistrates is one of the other meanings for this term Elohim. In fact, when you go back to Exodus 21 and 22, where God was establishing judges in the nation, the word Elohim is translated in our English as judges in both the King James and the New American Standard, Exodus 21, 6 and 22, 8 and 9. So the same word that is translated God in some places is also used for judges and magistrates in other places. What is the, what, what is the root of all heresy? Taking verses in, in the word of God out of context, okay? Now, Christ is saying, it, it, well, let's, let's come at this another way. Is Jesus saying that somehow, well, you guys just hang in there and be real faithful, and one of these days you're going to wake up and be God? It's going to be great, believe me. Is he saying that? Of course not. What does the full counsel of God say over and over again in too many verses to cite? There's only one God. Isaiah 44, 6. Deuteronomy. The Jews would say the Shema three times a day. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. What Christ is saying, tune in now, his point here is this. Look, you're charging me with blasphemy, all right? If you, if you guys in your own scriptures, Jewish leaders, if you guys in your own scriptures called unjust men gods, and that was not blasphemy, is this really the hat you want to hang me on? right? Because I use the word, your fathers use the word God for failed judges, no problem. But yet here I am, the living God in the flesh before you, I use that word and now all of a sudden it's blasphemy. How can you guys accuse me of blasphemy when your own failed judges were called Elohim? Christ is saying, look, guys, Your charge is totally bogus. Can we move the discussion, please, to something actually meaningful here? Can we take a more legitimate course here? Notice that legitimate course, picking it up in verse 37. And let's read 37 to 39. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works, so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I in the Father. Therefore they were seeking again to seize him, and he eluded their grasp. All right, well this is fascinating, especially verse 39. Well, earlier in chapter 3, you remember that Nicodemus, Nick at night, right? The Nick at night chapter. He comes to, to Jesus at night, and he says, you know, We know 
that you have come from God because no man can do the works that you are doing unless he is from God. In the Old Testament, the prophet said, look, the deliverer is going to come and he's going to do this, and he's going to do this, and he's going to do this. Christ comes along and he does this and this and this times 300, right? Fulfills 300 prophecies in the Old Testament. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, said, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God, did all these things in your midst. Peter was saying, look, this is the guy you've been waiting for. So Jesus is saying to these guys, look, I know I don't fit the mental picture that you had of your deliverer. I realize that you don't like exactly what it is that I have to say to you, but I'm telling you, even though I'm not fitting the image, even though... uh, I'm not telling you what you want to hear. Would you at least look at the works that I'm doing? Dudes, connect the dots. This is what the Old Testament says the Messiah will do, and this is exactly what I have done, and you still don't believe. In verse 39, oh man, we got to just really rip into this. Verse 39, these guys are saying, all right, well, we've heard enough. We didn't really want to hear him anyway. Let's just jump this guy and get on with it. Now remember, they're about three months from the cross, so his hour has not yet come. We've seen this already, right? Okay. What does that mean? That means they're not going to get him, are they? And I love the mystery of this. The word of God just lets this deal right off into the sunset of mystery and unknowing. I love it. We're not told how he got away. (laughs) But are you getting this guy? I mean, we'll get to that. He was totally surrounded. But are you getting this, guys? I mean, over and over, the word of God is letting us know in this gospel, the Holy Spirit is putting a particular, a particularly strong emphasis upon this fact. If you are walking with the, if you are walking in the will of God for your life, if you are remaining in him and his purposes for you, there is not a thing that can touch you. Okay? You are untouchable. You are divinely protected. But the key is if you're staying in his will, which most of the time we don't do. Now, did he have a phaser? Did he have a stun gun, a saber? Did he have some kind of Romulan cloaking device? We don't know, but somehow he got away. Again, guys, this is fantastic. He was totally surrounded, all right? I absolutely love the mystery of this. I'm sure these guys were like, Houdini, right? I mean, how does this guy keep doing this all the time? If you are walking in the will of God for your life, here's what the Word of God is telling you. If you are walking in the will of God for your life, you can't explain it, but you are divinely protected. You, don't, you, won't, you, don't, you won't always see it. I often wonder how many times did God cause the lady in back of me to hit her brakes the last minute. I mean, you just, you don't know it. That's what this is telling you. Over and over and over again. You're not going to know how, but God is somehow protecting you as you remain under the umbrella of his will for you, as you remain obedient. The degree to which you do that is the degree that you will walk in his blessing and protection. Okay? All right, finally tonight, Let's wrap it up with verses 40 to 42, and I can't think of a better close for the summer. Uh, Gina, 40 to 42, take us home. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing, and he was staying there. Many came to him and were saying, while John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. Many believed in him there. All right, now remember, it is winter, late December. At that time, many people would go down into the Jordan Valley, very lush tropical scene. It was a place where everybody would spring break, if you will, or or go there, in this case, as a winter resort. But it was also the place, we're told, where John had been baptized and where Christ had started his ministry. Now, remember that Jesus said John was the greatest prophet ever He said John was the greatest prophet ever born among women. Luke 7, 28. Is it not interesting? Give me your attention for just three more minutes, all right? Is it not interesting that on the one hand, greatest prophet ever born, 
And then on the other hand, we're being told in verse 41, John did no miracles. John did no sign or no wonder. Look at verse 41. No sign. Now, when we think of the great prophets, we think of Elijah and Elisha, floating axes and fire coming down from heaven, right? Now, that's a great prophet. But John, I mean, the guy never did anything spectacular, right? I mean, again, he did no sign. And yet, Jesus said, this is the greatest prophet that was ever born. And Jesus would say later, now when you went out to see John, what did you go out to see? Did you go out to see a reed blowing every which way in the wind? No. Did you go out to see a guy that votes for one thing and then does another? No. Did you go out to see some guy wearing fancy clothes? No. Luke 7. You went out and you saw a man of absolute conviction. You went out and you saw a man that just stood up and said, this is what I believe and this is why I believe it. You saw a man that was just simply living the life that God had given unto him. You see, the thing about John, all right, the thing about John is, He did not substitute doing things for being somebody. He did not substitute doing things for being somebody. Never forget, the most important thing is, again, what did we talk about earlier? Who you are. Listen, God does not reward success. God rewards faithfulness. Okay? We really need to get that because if we did, we'd be a whole lot easier on ourselves. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. You be faithful to what I've given you to do. I'll worry about the outcome. I've got things going on down the road that you can't even see. Well, I witnessed to this guy and nothing seemed to happen, but you leave that to me, God says. I want from you your faithfulness. I am not about your results. I am the result, okay? I'm responsible for the results. It's not important what you do. It is not important what you accomplish. It is important to God who you are. I guarantee you every evangelist that's been caught with a prostitute, Every priest that's molested a child, somewhere along the line, substituted doing things for being somebody. Okay? It's not what we do, it's who we are. Well, you know, I'm this and that, and, you know, I guess I can take a few liberties since I do all this for God. No, no, you, just, you just exchanged, you just ex- exchanged doing something for being somebody. Okay? It's not what we do, friends. It's who we are. You will not find the verb witnessing in the Bible. Look all you want. You will find the noun witness. It's not what we do. It's who we are. Here is the Lord holding up John, exalting John, a man that did no miracles, and he said, this guy is great. Not because he had flash, he didn't. Not because he did signs or wonders, he did none. But because the guy just did not back down from telling the simple truth about Christ. It's who he was. And the fruit of that is what we just read in verse 42. Many believed in him. This is powerful. I hope you're getting a hold of this. Interesting. Here's Jesus. He's in the Mecca, so to speak, of their religion. He's in Jerusalem, and he's being rejected. Now he goes out into the countryside among the common people where the whole deal started, and they accept him. Isn't that interesting? The degree that you don't understand truth is the degree that you're prideful. Point blank, straight up. And if you nod your head or you're saying, oh, gee, I wish we'd get out of here, you've just been convicted. You don't get it, all right? 
Isn't it interesting how much of the opposition to Jesus, isn't it interesting where that comes from today? It's not from the common people, right? It comes from the liberal religious professor at some university who has no relationship with God at all. There's just a degree on the dude's wall. He's just a religious professional. Well, you know, Jesus, <laughs> he didn't really walk on the water. There was a sandbar there, and Peter just didn't see the sandbar. <laughs> in closing, what Christ is saying to us in his word is that we are to be people of conviction, simply standing upon the truth of Christ. God never calls us to success. He simply calls us to faithfulness. He is not interested in what we do or accomplish. He is interested in who you are. Be faithful where you're at. Realize that the works of Christ are good and therefore the work that he wants to do in your life is good. We don't have to be flashy we don't have to be all charismatic and mystical. All we have to do is simply live the way that God is requiring us to live. And we're going to discover the same thing will be said of us. Man, you're great. Enter in. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Man, you've been faithful in a little. And now come in and look at all that you're going to enjoy world without end. Look what I have for you in the kingdom eternal. These guys said, Jesus, you, you being a man are constantly making yourself out to be God. Jesus was not a man making himself out to be God. Jesus was God making himself into a man. Do you see the difference? And he did so much for you and I. And all that he asks is that we would put away our pride, approach the full counsel of the worth of God, the word of God with the degree, the right degree of reverence and respect. Allow our arrogant selves to be swept aside then we will know truth, we will know peace, we will know joy, we don't have to struggle, we don't have to be uptight. Well, what's this going to happen or that's going to happen and this is my future and these are my goals and this is where I'm going. You're not, you're not going to care about any of that anymore. Man, you get God in your heart. You will walk into all that he has for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you have hidden these things from the supposedly wise and learned and that you have revealed to them to simple-minded people like us. Lord, we just push our pride aside and we just want to know you and we want to love you. Thank you for encouraging us in your word tonight that you don't care what kind of results we bring in or, or you just care who we are and that if we will just Listen to what you have to say to us, that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. If we will just seek you and desire to just know you and the peace that you have, we'll discover that everything else just fades into significance and we'll discover that we're free. We are free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Give us a hunger this summer, Lord, for your word. I, I pray for every heart that is here tonight that you would put a a holy fire in their hearts to seek you out. Drive them to your word that they might get to know you. Lord, I pray that you would speak to them abundantly and personally. Lord, that they would feel your great, great love and your peace and, and your freedom. God, we pray for great things this summer. Be with us, keep us, preserve us, protect us, develop our hunger, we ask in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. All right, that's the first half of the Gospel of John.